joining us, everyone. We really appreciate it. Um, this is Meet the Author with Keenan Powell. <clears throat> Just to tell you a little bit about her, um, her latest book is called Implied Consent, and it's about lawyer Maureen Gold, who has a dark secret and a need to prove herself. When a young woman walks into an office with a Hollywood Me Too case, hashtag Me Too case, Maureen mm -hmm. spots the chance for redemption. Enter the opponent, Maureen's father, Frank Gold, a man as evil as the movie producer he defends. While Frank pulls every dirty trick known inside the courtroom, someone behind the scenes is engineering Maureen's defeat. Doors are slammed in her face. Disturbing photographs are discovered. A witness dies mysteriously. Clearly, someone means to silence her. Will Maureen muster the strength to free herself from the past, reveal the truth, and win justice for a client? Keenan Powell is the author of the Maeve Mallory Mysteries, a three book series and numerous short stories. She belongs to Mystery Writers of America, Sisters in Crime and International Thriller Writers. She writes a legal column, ipso facto, for the Guppies newsletter, First Draft and blogs with misdemeanors. Despite being one of the original Dungeons and Dragons illustrators, art seemed an impractical pursuit not an heiress, wouldn't marry well, hated teaching, so she went to law school. The day after graduation, she moved to Alaska. When not writing or practicing law, Keenan can be found embroidering or studying the Irish language. Welcome, Keenan. Thank you so much for joining us here today. We really appreciate you um, coming to meet the author. Thank you so uh, much, and thank you for having me. Yeah, no problem. So um, one of the things I would like to know is um, after you graduated, why did you move to Alaska? Well, um, it, when I was in high school, actually, when I was in junior high, which was a girl where? moved down from Alaska and we were both in band together and she, they, her mother let her wear makeup. She was very exotic. And um, she ended up becoming best friend when we got to high school because we both had cars we both had driver's licenses so we both cut school together and um I still have nightmares that someone's going to audit my attendance and tell me I have to go back and finish you know a year <laughs> anyway so Babs was originally from Alaska and after we graduated high school she did a, a real quick it, it was a dental tech program and it was in Sacramento she went to school in Sacramento and we were in Vacaville. And um, then she came back up to Alaska and it was during the pipeline days and it was like wild and crazy place. And she kept calling me saying, you have to come up here. Now, you know, I'm a young woman in California and uh, at the time it was difficult to find uh, romantic interest. Um, because apparently all the men had moved to Alaska. And so <laughs> I came up and it was just wonderful. All I had to do was put on a little mascara and some high heels and, and would follow you down the street. Um, so I came back the day after I graduated. I had come up to visit her during a summer break. Um, and I was going to school at McGeorge in Sacramento. And, uh, and that was it. I found my new home. And at the time, it was 1982 when I graduated and California economy was horrible. And most of my friends were having difficulty finding jobs. One of them ended up joining the Air Force. One went to LA, God bless his soul. Um, yeah, so that, that was it. Um, <laughs> I went to Alaska and I've been here ever since. So that was wow. 1982. I graduated in 29th and I came up the next day. And um, what kind of law did you practice, if you don't mind me asking? Oh, I've done just about everything. At first, I was an associate with a small, uh, you know, like a general practice firm. In those days, you had those. And we did a little family law. And we did a little criminal defense. And we did some admin law and a little workers comp. And then um, what happened after? I moved into criminal law, criminal defense. Um, because I wanted to do trial work. Mm -hmm. And it, in the 80s, it was hard for a woman to get trial work. Um, so uh, I associated with firms and I picked up court-appointed cases. And then I was 
and I was going along, life was great. By then I had two kids and I came home from trial one day after doing like six trials in a row in a year and sleeping in my clothes and, and feeding the kids McDonald's. And they said they didn't want me doing trial work anymore. Oh, okay. Um, so I started doing um, domestics again. I had done domestics off and on. So I started doing domestics again, a lot less than they go to trial, but it's not a three week trial and you don't spend three weeks getting ready and then a week sleeping it off. So it was much, I, I was much more available for the kids doing domestics, but I hated domestics. So I moved into personal injury and then from personal injury, I was introduced to workers compensation where I, I represent injured workers because medicine's about the same, but the law is different. And now I do workers compensation exclusively um, I've been doing that for 10 or 15 years, representing injured workers. So you're still practicing? Yeah, not much. I mean, you know, two, three, four hours a day. And how and when did you get into fiction writing? Oh, I had no intention of writing a story until one day, and this is about, uh, it started when I was in a workers' comp, continuing legal education. We're required, we're required, are required to take three year, hours of ethics every year. And they strongly suggest it would be really nice if we took another nine hours of other stuff. And because I was doing workers' comp, I was learning workers' comp, I was trying to soak up all the stuff that I need, wanted. And so we had our annual workers' comp seminar and I'm sitting there and the woman next to me is knitting. And we're at a big table and there's people up there and there was these two old war horses that had been she each other for 30 years in different cases they liked each other but they they would get into a fight and then they'd just go off on a tangent so but they told a story about Fairbanks once upon a time they were in Anchorage and um I don't Sarah I don't know if you recognize their names it was Chancy Croft and Penny Zobel remember Ron Zobel Penny Zobel was his wife okay so um a man unfortunately passed away on the North Slope. He was working on the North Slope. He had, they thought he had a heart attack and his body was transported to Fairbanks. And there was a question whether or not the cause of death was work-related. I don't know, that's all, that, uh, that's all I know. Or if it was natural causes. And so what they were telling us was that they ran together, the only time they agreed on anything together, they ran to the Superior Court and they filed an filed a sued the medical examiner and asked for injunction against him disposing of the remains because I did not know this. Um, and this is the law in many states, I looked it up. Um, when medical examiner can determine the cause of death in Alaska without doing an autopsy, just looks at him and says, oh, I guess he died a heart attack. And if nobody claims the remains within 72 hours, he can dispose of them, which means cremate them. So the evidence is gone in 72 hours. So they went off like a bunny and to get an injunction against the Emmy doing that. The reason it was interesting to me is that a year or two before, there had been like 12 deaths, homeless deaths in the summer. And they were like one a week, pretty precise, one a week. And it was weird that homeless people were dying in the summer when they made it through the winter, you know, in Anchorage, and now suddenly they're dying one in the week. And people are writing letters to the editor saying, we think there's a serial, serial, serial killer around. Somebody's killing these people off. And the police kept telling the editor to tell everybody that, no, there's no serial killer. They all died of natural causes. It's just a coincidence. Well, as it turns out, I knew that the medical examiner was actually out on sick leave and there were different doctors all over Anchorage that were pitching in for him. Um, so there were, that's, and I thought, that's it. These guys are just looking at these people thinking they died natural causes uh, that a homeless person would die of. Right. And then they're disposing of the remains because nobody's gonna claim them. And so this guy, somebody is killing these people off in a way that looks like a natural cause for a homeless person. I thought, that's it. That's how they did it. And I actually slapped my head and said, that's how I did it. And, woman that. and um, I told a friend of mine that I went to law school with uh, that I had this idea for a story. I thought that this needs to be so I figured it out 
and the police are wrong, so I need to write a book about it. <laughs> and uh, I went to a, um, it was a, it was a legal seminar. It was for lawyers, but it was how to write a thriller, a legal thriller for lawyers. And it was down, I think it was in San Diego. And I flew down and did it. It was a one day thing. And I flew back and she, we, she asked us what our stories were. And Pamela Young was there. I think that's her name. Pamela Young was one of the speakers. And I told her that. And the woman who was running it was an old agent that had retired. She said, that story has legs. Go home and write it. So then I started writing it. And uh, which was a long process. And it took me like three or four years to figure out how to write a story. And um, it sold. And then I and I was starting to write other stories and stories kept coming. So that's I figure I'll just keep writing them when they keep coming, as long as they keep coming. So that was Deadly Solution. And that I had won the Mouse Domestic Grant with that. And that book was nominated for Lefty and Agatha and a Silver Falchion. And the second book in the series was um, Hemlock Needle. And the third book of the series was Hell in High Water. And those were all the Maeve Malloy series set in, Anchor in around Anchorage, Alaska, Alaska. And then I wanted to branch out a little bit. So I wrote an historical that hasn't been published yet. Oh, thank you, James. And um, then I wrote Implied Consent. When we, it, it was right after we got sent home from Left Coast Crime in 2020. We spent yeah. the whole day doing Left Coast Crime. Matt Coyle was the postmaster. He got, he was being interviewed that, uh, I think it was Thursday night. And then at the interview, he announced the mayor has shut us down and we're all going home tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and nobody knew what the world was gonna be like. So I came home and uh, started writing and applied consent. I think I only did three drafts of it. So I'm kind of pleased with how it's doing. Great. So tell us about Implied con Consent. Um, what, when did it come out? It came out, what did it come out? I did just published it January 26th of this year. Oh, oh good. Great. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about the origins of that book. <laughs> okay. Well, that book was, I had read, um, oh, goodness gracious, Frank Sinatra's ex-wife, Mia Farrell, Ronan Farrell's book, um, called Catch and Kill. I read Catch and Kill. And Ronan Farrell, you know, his sister Dylan Farrell was involved in a big custody dispute between Woody Allen and Mira, Mia Farrell because she had disclosed that there had been inappropriate touching by Woody uh, Allen. And he kept talking about during the time he didn't feel like he supported her enough. And then it blew up a second time and he felt like he didn't support her enough. So then the story comes along um, with the uh, Hollywood producer, whose name just went out my head. Someone will think of it. I know who you're talking uh, about. Henry, yeah. fi fi Henry. Feinstein. Fein Weinstein. 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 Harvey. Weinstein. Is it Harvey. Harvey Weinstein. Harvey. Yeah. <laughs> so he was working on the Harvey Weinstein story and about how Harvey Weinstein would have a publisher who would go out and um, buy stories from these people that were making accusations against them, promising them that they would be publicized and killing the story. It was catch and kill. And I thought, well, that's very nice of Ronan that um, he feels bad and trying to compensate to the world for, you know, to sister Dylan for not supporting her. And it was a really well-written book. I said, but I thought, you know, um, it could be told, the story could be told fictionally about that kind of event from the point of view of someone who feels it and is going through something similar. So that's how that got started. And I did a class with Lit Reactor. Have you, um, you, know, have you heard of them? Um, oh, David, David, Jim, what's David's last name? J David Corbett teaches classes. Thank you. And, um, and that guy that Opie just a bunch of people teach through them. But I did a class with him and I did a class with the other guy. Jim will remind me in a minute whose his name is, who write who wrote a, a book about fire. Ron Howard opted it. Anyway, um, and they thought it was a good story, that it was going somewhere. So that helped develop it and helped me uh, put the structure together. 
Yeah. And I did actually, I started it once in third person. I started once first person, I started third person, and then went back to first person, and then I just like ran through it. Rob Hart, that's the guy. Um, Rob Hart thought uh, he it was pretty much the same story. He's like, that's a good story. He said it has legs, go home and write it. So I did. And I actually ended up cutting out so much that I'm using the I had a two cases, Lit Reactor. It's a, Lit Reactor is a great resource for taking classes and for doing workshops. And it, it's not too terribly expensive. And I had a parallel um, case. I had her juggling two cases and um, it was just too long. It was 120,000 words. So I took out one of the cases and that's gonna become the second book, The Millionaire. So it's gonna be a seri another series. Yeah, I originally thought alone. I put my heart and soul into this, but then, you know, if I'm serious about wanting to sell books and do it self-published, uh, it's better to do a series. Mm. It's easier to garner readers. Mm -hmm. To get their we... interest and keep them yeah. coming back. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because they do. I know I do. I wait. I love series. Yeah. Yeah. And Deborah Cromie, first next time she, mm -hmm. I get her books immediately. Yeah. Um, Richard Osman. I can't mm. wait for his next book. Oh, thank you, Jim. He says, I'm reading Marina's Too Good to Leave Behind as standalone. Thank you. Um, so it sounds like um, you draw a lot um, in, in your fiction from, from real life, from real cases. You get a lot of inspiration. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about how you balance that, um, especially when some of these cases are pretty controversial? Um, well, what I do is I ha I've done a lot of Me Too, not a lot. I did a few Me Too cases back when I was doing personal injury before we called it Hash to Me Too. Mm -hmm. um, and it was in the context of foster parents or workplace or school, things like that. Um, so I draw on my experience that way. But I kind of like the rip from the headlines, mm -hmm. you know, elements. Um, and I, I decided to go with the Hollywood thing just because, you know, Hollywood's sexier than maybe a law. Sure. I actually thought about doing it in a courthouse, having it be like a courthouse thing, but there was going to be a bunch of law in it anyway. So I kind of wanted to get out of the courthouse for part of the story. And I sit in San Francisco because um, the first thing that when they said we couldn't go anywhere, we all had to stay home. I wanted to go to San Francisco. I had this urge to go to San Francisco. <laughs> and I was Googling San Francisco, looking at pictures and feeling sorry for myself. And uh, so I thought, in my head, I can go to San Francisco. And uh, eventually, I will go down there and ride off some trips, too. Yeah. And is the second one also set in San Francisco, then? Yeah, it's set in San Francisco. She has a little condo. It's like she has my dream life, you know, if I'd stayed in San Francisco. She has a this condo that is in a rehabilitated old warehouse south of market. So it's all urban chic. Mm -hmm. And she drives around in a little yellow BMW M5 and it's bright sunny yellow because there's an attorney, now famous attorney, all these things going on in my head, I'm sorry. Who used to drive around a yellow Rolls Royce in San Francisco, Elvin, Elvin Belli. He drove around and, and I saw his yellow Rolls Royce, Rolls Royce once. He came up to McGeorge and, and talked to us. And he parked it, it was like a block long in front of the school. We all went out and looked at the car. We were really impressed. We all wanted to be Melvin Belli. He was just such a big personality. And um, so she wants to be just like Melvin Belli. So she has, but she has a little yellow BMW M5 that she likes to launch on the on ramps onto the highway. And then her husband is a prosecutor that used to be a cop. So there's a little bit of romance in there. And then she has a cat that hates her. <laughs> the cat's name is Jermaine Greer. I'm sorry, I didn't catch the name of the cat. Jermaine Greer. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Jake, her husband, Dick Kuhn, gave her the cat. And uh, the cat hates her. <laughs> uh, so can you tell us a little bit about the next book? The Millionaire. Okay, so this story is about uh, before the story and implied consent. In fact, the implied consent opens with Maureen being on the courthouse steps and a big verdict just came in and she's 
she's kind of a, a glory hound. So she's, you know, out there doing this impromptu press conference on the courthouse steps, and, but they don't have steps anymore, but you know what I mean. Um, and the case that she won is the case that's gonna be in this book, but what's gonna, there's an aftermath of it. So she won this case, got millions of bucks for a kid, and he, well, he had been a kid 10 years before, and he was going to a fictional academy in San Francisco, Lafayette Academy, and he was on the chess team, and he had been molested serially by the chess coach. And then he grew up and realized this wasn't his fault, went through years of counseling, went to the police, told the police what happened and they said well it's been too long it's almost 10 years there's no evidence there's nothing we can do for you um so he falls suit on his own and his name's tony paredes and um and then the insurance defense attorneys were just slamming him with paper just snowing him with paper so he comes into he shows up in Marine's office and she takes his case wins it gets his multi-million dollar judgment and then the day after the judgment comes in uh, a couple jurors contacted the defense attorney and said these other two jurors had done uh, investigation online and they had found evidence that was not admitted during the case and has specifically been included during the case. And they came in and told the rest of the jury about this evidence that was inadmissible, which tainted the verdict and the verdict got set aside. Um, and Maureen advises Tony that he needs to settle the case and he gets mad at her and storms out of the, her office. And that's the last she sees him until the guy that molested Tony, his name's Oscar, won the home, is murdered. And Tony's on the phone going, Maureen, I'm so sorry. Come back and take care of me. Save me. And that is called, that book's The Millionaire. It sounds like you're pretty far along in that book. Oh, yeah. Um, I I got to the point where I got to the denouement. Um, and I know it's going to happen. So I went back, you know, I, I sketched it out. I went back and I started like moving things around and working on the uh, structure of it. I didn't like the structure. And I'm about to dive into the second uh, draft of it. So I should have the third draft early this summer. And I've got until January, you know. So I'll get it to my babies in May, June, nah, July. So you're hoping to publish in January and then like a year after implied consent? Yeah, that was my plan. Um, I'm going to publish that series on January 26th of every year. And I know traditionally we, we published on Tuesdays, but I think that, that had to do with the newspaper business and trucks and you had to move trucks. <laughs> we can publish anything we want now. Yeah. And so I picked January 26th because it's my granddaughter's birthday. Oh. And then my historical, I'm going to publish on September 23rd, which is my grandson's birthday. But I have another grandson. So I'm going to release a volume of short stories that are just goofy little stories I've written and collected over the years. I'm going to do that on his birthday next year. April 3rd. Nice. So you're yeah. you're pretty busy. Well, you know, I have a lot of material. I've been, uh, and when the law business is slow, I'm just writing a mm -hmm. lot. So I built up a lot of material and I had a lot to say. You know, it's so gratifying. You guys all know writing crime fiction because you can make the story come out the way you want. Yeah. It's not like real life. Right. Yeah, the, you can make the good guys win. Mm -hmm. Justice prevails and all that. Yeah. Yeah. That's why I like it too. <laughs> yeah. Um, so what about your first series, the Maeve series? Are you going to go back to that? Maeve Malloy? I don't know. It's reverting. Um, the first book I took, I took back the rights to the first book this year and republished it. Mm -hmm. So if you see it on Amazon, the first cover looks different than the other two colors covers and they'll revert once one a year. Um, so Hamlock Mead will come back to me next year and Helen Highwater will come back the year after. So I'm, I'll probably see how uh, Marine does um, mm -hmm. and how my historical does and then think about whether or not I want to write more Maves. I had charted out. I had like 18 stories charted out. I think I hope I kept my notes somewhere. Um, 
because there's so much you could do in Alaska. But, I, I, you know, I, Dana Stavino is doing really well with her Alaska series. And she took back the rights to her first series, her Kate Shugat series. And there was another series she did Alaska, and then she intertwined them. And she's publishing, republishing those now. Um, so there is some interest in Alaska, but it, I don't think it's as universal as it is to some place like San Francisco. Yeah. Um, oh, I'm sorry, I just totally lost my train of thought. <laughs> okay. um, I did want to ask you, though, um, you, you said something about a new cover, right? Do we have a cover to see? Oh, yeah, well, we have the cover from a historical that is coming out oh, okay. September 23rd. Oh, great. Bruce has it. Not Bruce. Uh, Rick. Did Rick has it. I like it. And you put it in the chat I, earlier. I put it in chat. Oh, oh, you put oh, it in chat? Okay. And I can't I can't seem to get someone else who's got control of the <laughs> the screen now. I can't get I can't get my screen share. Oh, there it is. It's at the top of the chat. What do you think? Yeah. I like it. Yeah. Can everyone so, see it okay? Um I wasn't able to get to it. That's okay. So um, is it a historical mystery or a historical? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I was thinking, I am have been enamored with Charles Todd. I've read all oh, of yeah. Ian's mm -hmm. books. What's Ian's last name? I, it would be nice if I showed up with a, a faculty for language today, wouldn't it? <laughs> um, it's just names. Books, <laughs> yeah, the book's about his male protagonist, that World War I vet. Yeah. The one that had, he has a ghost of or it's uh -huh. not his ghost, it's a split personality. Oh, I like it. Him. I like it too. So I um, I like the feel of Charles Todd's books. And then I thought, I really wanted to create, well, what happened was I went to visit Adams, Massachusetts a few years ago on the genealogy um, thing. And I had met one of my distant cousins on Ancestry. And so we were like, walking around and, you know, graveyards and taking pictures of headstones. And, uh, and another friend of us had access to the um, records, all the birth and uh, death records. So we're pawing through all those. Anyway, and I thought this Adams is such a cute little town. Now it's, it's poor and it's kind of run down. Um, but that is where my from Ireland. And there was a point I learned after going through all of this um, the census as all this other, you know, documents that after my family came there in 1865 and um, there was an older couple and their three teenage sons and their adult daughter and her husband and their three little kids. And like by 30, 40 years later, there were 60 of us. Oh. And my grandfather, my great grandfather ended up building an apartment building and putting the family in there. And everybody lived in the particular apartment complex. Um, they call them apartments, but they're like condos. They're individually in the, um, anyway, they're right downtown. So it was, it was a trip. So um, their name, the family name was Barrett. And um, there's a, a building called the PJ Barrett historical building. And it's at the whole block is a historical thing because Patrick Joseph Barrett was a figure at point in time. There's the Barrett Mansion. There's the Barrett Hotel, which is now uh, a residence for older people, assisted living. And I thought I wanted to create something like Three Pines, you know, oh. a place where people came to um, for safety and, uh, and, and building a new life. So I have all these Irish immigrants and some Scottish immigrants that have come to this place. And what happened is when the Irish came, the Quakers were there. It was a Quaker uh, because Susie ben Anthony was born there. That's where oh, she okay. was born. And um, but the Quakers were leaving. They were finding better farmland and they were selling the land to the Irish people. So I put um, Liam's living on a farm with his family and it's the farmland is where I imagine I couldn't I didn't find it on that trip but because it's been subdivided but it's a farm that my great-great-grandfather owned overlooking Adams town and then there's this mountain that everybody Mount Greylock which kind of dominates the scenery so yeah that and I thought I needed a story for that so I built Story around that and I want that to be a series there's a whole community and so I'm cooking the second story in my brain 
Yeah, this so is, it sounds just, like you are a plotter. You well, I would. I would, I really wish I was. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> the millionaire. I wrote the whole thing through, pantsed it all the way through, oh. and I've pantsed every other book through. And then uh, somebody called it reverse plotting at, when I was at Left Coast Crime, because then I go back and I outline. Because until now, I mean, and I need. I would be great if I were a plotter, but I would write the whole book and not understand really why I need. To, what's this message I'm trying to get out? I don't understand. So I get the whole thing out over the course of, you know, like three or four months, the first draft, and then go back and read it, you know, and outline it and see what's missing. And uh, and then it comes to me. But I had a strong idea with Liam where I wanted that one to be about. And uh, the second one's kind of vague. So I took, um, was it with you guys, Ellen Byron's plotting class? Last yeah. Month. yeah, I'm, you know, I'm sold. I want to be just like Ellen Byron. <laughs> and I took furious notes. And uh, in fact, then I had her notes all pinned up and I've got the like big blocks of tags on my draft on my outline for the millionaire of all, all the points Ellen talked about in the A plot and the B plot, that stuff. So I can remember it every time I'll go through a scene, make sure I hit all that stuff. It would be easier, it'd be faster. I don't know, I'm a plotter and not faster. <laughs> oh. You're, you're well, much I, <laughs> My first book, Deadly Solution, I lost count at 15, but I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know what I was doing. I wrote each chapter as a separate document. I drafted, so I printed it all out and I laid it out on the floor and I like got a first act, I got a third act, then I had the first half of the second act and there's like a big hole there on my carpet. And I thought, <laughs> oh, I've got to figure out what, how to do this. So I started outlining books that I liked, Stuart, and one of Stuart Neville's books, and I drew up this big chart with stress and or you know and tension and made these points and they've graphed it all out and then I graphed mine and like I got this flat line there and then so that's how I did it and I got Hallie Efron's book and read that mm -hmm. and I I read that very readily and all, all the Save the Cat books and all the Hollywood writer books um, but I think that Hallie Efron's book was probably the best oh and James and Fry's those are good books too Someone sent all those to me. So your historical is coming out in September. Yep. Then you'll have another um, implied consent came out in this past January and you'll have another one coming out the following January. Yes, that's the plan. And I have a couple short stories, a couple Liam short stories that I have published. Um, one was in the Mouse Domestic Anthology and the other one was in the Crime Bake Anthology. And I'm gonna publish those in June. I'm, I, I'm, I'm revising them and they, they revert back to you after a year and I'm going to put those in like a little 99 cent ebook oh, as nice. you know an introduction to Liam and the reason I had written those was to try to see if I could develop the character of Liam and if it was something that people would like and I got really good response from it with Liam I was trying to create somebody a young man that if an older lady like me met this young man on the street you would want to take him home, feed him dinner, have him fix something, and introduce him to your daughter. Mm -hmm. And I like him. So far, so good. Yeah. Well, uh, do we have any questions from the audience? Rick, <laughs> are you there? There, we lose, Rick? I'll unmute myself. There we go. <laughs> okay. I said such uh, great great things you didn't hear. Okay, what made you switch to legal thrillers? Well, Maeve Malloy's legal thriller. They're all it. they're all legal thrillers. Um, but Liam's a police procedural. And another thing, the reason I wanted to do a historical police procedural is I wanted to do it before there was any CSI hmm. or cell phones. It's just you know one guy who out trying to outsmart everybody else and figure it so he he has to rely on his wits and his intelligence uh what are the similarities between your main characters maureen and Moab? they are so similar 
I write Marvel, Maeve a lot. <laughs> um, typing up Marine. Uh, Maeve was an orphan um, and she's a recovering alcoholic. She's a young attorney who just left the public defender's office to start her own practice. And she had to leave the PD's office because she had an affair with her boss and he married somebody else, broke her heart. And um, so and so she's just starting out and she's, you know, got this big empty office with this, you know, furniture she bought secondhand, but she doesn't have anybody helping her. And she's got this kind of crusty PI who works with her uh, on her cases. And then Marie is... Uh, was raised in Pacific Heights, uber rich family. Um, her father was an attorney, her mother was an heiress, and uh, she has this really cool condo, like I said, Soma, and she has a um, really cool office condo in Jackson Square. Jackson Square, right? Um, old historical brick building. I made this all up. You could see Coit window, the Coit Tower right outside her window. I made that all up too. And um, so, and she had just left the DA's office because she was prosecuting sex offenders, but she felt like that she wasn't doing enough to help the victims. She was putting the bad guys away, but the victims weren't getting anything out of it except, you know, their story told all over the courtroom floor. Um, and she wanted to be able to help the victims and help them get back on their feet. And so she went into private practice and she has enough money that she hired a paralegal who's like her office mom, Yolanda Martinez. And uh, I really like Yolanda. And people respond well to her. She's kind of a little bit bossy. So that they're, you know, both young attorneys, both redheads <laughs> and uh, Irish descent. And I write, I write Irish characters because that's what I am. And that's, you know, what I, that's how I see the world is through that um, prism that of the culture that I've inherited. But, you know, Maureen and Maeve have a lot less of it than Liam's going to have because he's going to be surrounded with Irish immigrants and first generation Irish. How about a couple of anecdotes in your life in Alaska that's made it into your stories? Um, well, um, in the second book, yeah, Hemlock Needle. There's a car wreck on ice. <laughs> 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 I've wrecked a lot of cars on ice. Um, <laughs> I talk about uh, driving up the Matanuska Valley and seeing the, the northern lights. It's late in the summer, so it's getting dark. And it, it, is, it is light here all the time, eventually. This is summer, right? It's, it's not here. We just got 100. We just broke 100 inches of snow, and it's still snowing. But um, June 21st, we'll have five and a half hours of dark. About and one hour on either side of that dark will be twilight. So it's about, and it's really never really dark in Alaska. And even in the winter, it's not really dark in town because you've got all the street lights and they're bouncing, you know, all these lights reflecting off the snow and the, and the clouds. Um, so you don't, we don't see the northern lights in the summertime until like, so it's nice in the late summer, sometimes it'll get dark if you're out late driving around out in the valley away from the light pollution and you get to see the lights. I, I really like the lights. Well, there's a question I'm sure all of us are interested in and why, when and why did you switch to self-publishing and, and what have you learned through that experience? I got really frustrated um with agents and publishers and I had a publisher for the first series but I felt like um I could do better get more attention um was not using any small independent publishers so I started looking for an agent with the sorrowful girl and um, I was signed by an agent they had the book for a year and they couldn't sell it and that was in the middle of COVID and, uh, you know, publishing, they were all screaming about for them. Both publishers didn't know how they were going to make it. And uh, so that was the end of that. And I, um, so I had my consent was done and it was ready to be published. And what I was getting from other agents, I'm out like, 
querying agents again was either they already had a Me Too book or the, all the publishers, which what there's of them, um, already had a Me Too book. So there was no more marketing for Me Too book. And I thought, well, if all these people have Me Too books, they can't get them to the market for two years. And I'll get mine to the market first. And I thought, the hell with them. You know, I'm not getting any younger. Mm -hmm. And uh, I got really tired of people saying, well, just go write another story and we'd be happy to look at your next story. You put a year of your life into this, even if it's three drafts. Um, it was with revising it and sending it to the betas and bringing it back and fine tuning it. You know, that's a year of your life. And I'm, I just got tired of the gatekeepers. So I thought all the time, I, and I've spent 10 years studying the craft of writing, and I think, you know, I've gotten a, a handle on it. I can always get better. We can, except maybe the grades. There's always room for improvement. Um, but I thought I'll take all that energy I spent on studying craft and study marketing. And that's why I just decided to self-publish because I wanted to get implied consent out. And I got such a good response to it. I thought, well, I'm just going to keep doing it. Good. Excellent. Do you have a, a favorite scene or chapter in, in, in Implied Consent? Mm. Mm. I really like the scene on the courthouse steps. Because I really like Maureen. Because she, uh, she has this history. And you, I think that you sense in that first scene that there's some fragility to her, um, that she has something to prove, um, but that she's a glory hound. She knows she's a glory hound. And, um, and she enjoys getting all that attention from the press. I, I think it was fun. It was fun for me to write that. Somebody who's that outgoing and that comfortable with being out in the public and getting attention, because I'm not that way. I was I was seriously a shy person. It took, I don't know why I wanted to go to trial law, because I guess I saw, you know, Perry Mason. I was watched that, didn't I? Um, and it, doing trial and uh, practicing law is a little safer than writing, I think, because you're telling somebody else's story. The story's already written for you. You just have to, passionate right um but here the story's coming out of us we're finding the story inside of us and, and you know inspiration uh so i kind of admire her because she's gutsier i think than i would or would be and then i, I really like the feeling of being in a bmw m5 and flying up the on-ramp onto i-80 or whatever i think it's 260 she's flying down the highway going south towards daly city that just felt like fun to me. Well, this, that's kind of a neat, neat segue into the next question is why you did not set the new series in Alaska? That was why. I've, <laughs> I've done it. I want to be in San Francisco driving cars. Yeah. And, and I want to be in at the ferry building and smelling the flowers. And I want to go to book passages and buy coffee and browse through the books. And last time I was there, I when I go visit, and it's some uh, sometimes I'll get like a three day weekend and go down there. I haven't done it since before COVID, but I would stay near Union Square and I'd ride either the cable car out to Fisherman's Wharf and then walk back to the ferry building and take the cable cars back, or go the reverse route and do that every day. Because I just love San Francisco so much. Except the one day I did the walk, I went to see all the Diego Rivera uh, murals. I did that and took the cable car up to somewhere in California Street and then came down and wandered back. So um, I, I just like walking around the place. So I get to do this in my head. Okay, this is so I was going to say, yeah, sitting on the ferry building, get with a cup of coffee and a book and watching the... Uh, seagulls being sitting behind it watching the seagulls and the fairies going in and out that's just like my ideal heaven this is a little out of uh, out of order but uh kind of fits do you have a writing community in alaska that you're uh, tight with well there's stan jones dana stabenow lives in homer and i've met her like twice um but stan jones who writes the nathan active series which 
was really pretty popular for a while and um and he's still working on it. He's up here and uh, we went walking once a week until we got a hundred inches of snow um, outdoors. Um, so I get together with him and I used to have a writing group up here, but now I'm with a writing group with international thriller writers. They started this program. They were test testing out a program and I joined it like a year and a half ago. I'm with a group that I really like, and we have Zoom meetings once a month and exchange our stuff beforehand. So, yeah, um, there's a, a Mark Cameron lives up here. He used to, do you know Mark Cameron, the uh, thriller writer? I think he was writing for James Patterson for a while. Um, he was a federal marshal when I was a baby lawyer. And so he would do court security when I was doing felony trials over in federal court. And the first time I saw him at some event, I'm like, God, you look familiar. And he's doing the same thing like that. You look familiar too. Uh, so we figured that we knew a bunch of people in common, but we don't hang really because cops and lawyers don't really mesh. <laughs> Uh, this is a three-part question. Is, uh, how long does it take you to write your first draft, and do you write straight through or and ignore your internal editor? And then uh, do you use beta readers? I think you already answered that question. But Yes, I write straight through and ignore the editor, and uh, I, try not, I try not to think the prose. And um, sometimes I know that the prose is just really, really bad. It's like Dick Saw Jane. Run, spot, run. I'm, I'm, I can feel myself. I'm writing just like that. I thought, I'll fix it later. I'm just, just get the story down. And um, and then I come back to it. Yeah, and I use beta readers. They are, uh, you can't measure how important beta readers are. And I have a few. I have a paralegal um, who I used to work with up here. And now she's living in Oregon. Uh, and she reads my stuff to make sure that, you know, I haven't got too much law in it. And then I like to have non-lawyer beta readers to make sure that I'm not beating people to death and putting them to sleep with the law. And the feedback I've gotten back so far on implied consent is that there's just the right amount of law in it that I explained it well. And I'm really pleased with that. Because sometimes, can't imagine that, but not all law is exciting to non-lawyers as it is to us. Um, so we need, another person that tells them, okay, it's time for you to stop talking. I understand that lawyer spouses <laughs> hate going to lawyer parties because we're no fun. We just talk about law. Anyway, yeah, beta writers are, uh, you have to have them. Was it uh, difficult for you to write dialogue for the historical fiction book? Um. A little bit, well, what I did, because I don't really know what language people were using in late 19th century. Um, so um, it's not really recorded. So what I've been doing is listening um, to a lot of all the Irish writers. And I thought at least I'm not trying to imitate the accent, or but I tried to get the syntax correct because the, these people in my book, um, they spoke Irish and then they learned to speak English and Irish. And I'm now I'm studying and understanding why Irish writers and it's called Hiberno Irish or Hiberno English, the way that um, Benjamin Black writes. It has a different syntax, and that's because the Irish syntax is so strange to English speakers. It's, it's just like Yoda speaks the way Irish people speak. Um, so, I, so I listen to, a lot of books and I, I like to listen to them rather than read them because it's easier to get the rhythm. And then for the Scottish people, I listen to Ian Rankin books because there's a couple of Scottish. Uh, people in there. And then Katrina McPherson just, thankfully, she's a doll, just read through the Scottish stuff for me to make sure that I, you know, didn't mess up any idioms or if she had a better suggestion. And, uh, and then of course, there's some Americans in there, so that wasn't so hard. So, you know, I tried to write it in a formal way, more like, you know, Charles Todd writes. 
for his books. Um, and it's a little slow. You can get a lot more atmosphere into it, I think. We'll see how it does. Excellent. A uh, question about uh, what social media platforms uh, are you on and uh, where can we follow you? Ah, I'm on Facebook five times a day. Um, I do have a Facebook author page and then I have a Facebook personal page where I post a lot of pictures of my dogs. We were very interesting. <laughs> My dog Tiberius particularly enjoys watching Inspector Morse. So if I'm watching Inspector Morse or Father Brown, um, I'll post that. He loves Morse. I think it's the music. I think he likes Barrington Flom. Mm -hmm. um, then I also have Instagram, which half the time I'm posting stuff about my books and half times I'm posting pictures of something I'm embroidered. I got into a embroidery because my dogs needed more me time, but I didn't want to play with them all the time. I just wanted to be able to sit in the room with them and do something that if they had to go out quickly, I could throw it to the side. And if I read a book and get into a book, I ignore the dogs and they don't like that. So that's why I got into embroidery. And I mean, I'd done it when I was little, when I was little and I, done, I did it when I was college. So, so you'll see embroidery and Book covers. Excellent. If you want to follow my Instagram. Jennifer just put up your website on the chat. Yes, I have a website. Yeah, and then we can uh, we can distribute your other information. Yeah, and if you, if you want to follow my newsletter, uh, you know you can sign up on my website. And um, if you wait a little bit, though, uh, I'm going to put Deadly Solution up as a reader magnet. Um, in May for people who sign up from our website. Um, it'll be free. It'll be accessible free to new people. And I'm beginning on um, BookBub followers. I'm getting like one or, you know, maybe three or four a week have been coming in since implied consent. And I really haven't been pushing it, but that's a nice place, you know, that- Could you, could you repeat that? What was the name of that again? BookBub. Oh, book, but yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm on Goodreads too, but BookBub seems this seems to be more interaction there. I don't know. Uh, the KenanPowell.com is your legal one. Yes, right. KenanPowellAuthor.com. <laughs> okay, I just went there and I was like, mm. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah. Let's see. The Powell yeah. Author. Yeah. Okay. Well, maybe we need legal help. <laughs> we only if you're in alaska there <laughs> yeah <laughs> well and that's all, the last of the questions that I have. on the home page oh, sorry i was gonna say that's the last of the questions that we have from from the audience so and although there's a lot of juicy material in workers comp there is i oh, had yeah. an ideal yeah, for a workers comp book uh for mave and i might give it to maureen you know, did I miss any here? We timed it perfectly. We're all. <laughs> yeah, how about that? <laughs> it's well, like thank we you. <laughs> yeah. Thank Would you for having me. You? It was a lot of fun. Thank you so much for joining us, Keenan. We really appreciate it. It was really fun hearing about your exploits in Alaska and your writing career. <laughs> Well, come visit us in Northern California soon. I will. Um, I'm, I'm, my class reunion is coming up. Gross. Um, but I'm just, I'm just going to come a cousin down there. If you see me driving <laughs> very fast on I-80, that's why that a yellow beaver. <laughs> where, where did you go to school? Uh, Backville High. Oh, okay. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Bulldogs. So you're from our neck of the woods. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Jessica yeah. lives there now, doesn't she? Jessica, Jessica Klein? Yeah, yeah. yeah. The yeah. onions were the onion factory. It used uh -huh. to be, yeah, there was an onion dehydrator there for a few decades. So every time you tell anybody from California that you're from Vacaville, they're going, where the onions are? Because yeah. <laughs> the whole, you should drive through it and everything would reek of onions. You learn you know, to it's love it. jelly bellies. Yeah, yes. All the, yeah. They, yeah, they have all those shops across from Nut Tree. Oh, I miss Nut Tree. Nut Tree, that was it. Yeah. 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 And the coffee tree and then a bunch of Nelson. Yeah. Yeah. I remember when that opened. Yeah, yeah. 
I was out here then too, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a lot of fun. Yeah, so, but hopefully in uh, years to come, I will have more time to come down and hang out and come to your in-person events. That would be great. Yeah. Yes, we'd, we'd love, love that. To see yeah, <laughs> we have some great bookstores over here too. Um, so while you're here, you might want to cruise on by. Make the ride. Yeah, I saw Katrina's always doing it. She releases, yeah, has released here, parties. We'll there. There's mm -hmm. one in Sacramento. We've got Capital Books, Faith, Faith in a Book up in El Dorado Hills, which is a little further out from Sacramento. But yeah. yeah. And we just did Woodland, Pleasant Pheasant, and Woodland. Mm -hmm. That was a fun Woodland. bookstore. Yeah. I was blown yeah. away when I found out people were living in winters. I mean, it was not that big of a deal. Um, <laughs> back in the 70s, it was just a little farming community. And I guess now it's becoming kind of a bedroom community for Davis. Yeah. 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 Oh. All right. Okay. Well, Good thank to you. see you. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Thank Good you so night. much for joining thank us. You. And don't thank forget you. Saturday's meeting with Karen Ogden.